Okay, we are here with Anne Marcatello. And thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely, it's a pleasure to be here. So let me start off with, with the, the, the first big question. How did you get involved with this case? Sure. So this case was first filed back in 2014. It's hard to believe at this point, it's almost 10 years ago. Um, and the case was filed specifically after a wave of massive draconian cuts to funding, to state funding in Pennsylvania. So in 2011 and 2012, the state cut about a billion dollars of school funding. And for Philadelphia specifically, it was about $300 million. And these cuts had drastic draconian implications on school districts and their ability to educate their students. Hundreds of thousands, Hundreds, thousands of teachers were uh, lost or laid off. Um, class sizes increased dramatically and school districts had to cut extracurriculars. They really had to drastically cut back on the education they were able to give to their students. So organizations approached the Public Interest Law Center and the Education Law Center, who are our co-counsel in this case, um, about filing this suit. It was really clear Everyone knows there is a long history of underfunding in, in Pennsylvania, but specifically at this time, it was clear something had to change. And so the Public Interest Law Center and the Education Law Center have a history of being involved in these cases in school funding suits and educational equity suits um, and had previously represented petitioners. So they were approached about filing the suit. And then they approached O'Melveny and Myers, which is where I work, um, to partner with them as a litigation pro bono counsel. Uh, O'Melveny has a long history of being involved in civil rights litigation, but specifically in educational equity suits. Uh, our, our former partner, Bill Coleman, was co-counsel on Brown v. Board of Education, and he has represented petitioners in Pennsylvania in other school equity, school funding suits, um, and so O'Melveny was just a natural fit, and we were happy to take on this case and champion this really important cause, and that is how we got to where we are. So can you give us a little bit of a synopsis of the case? Yeah, absolutely. So as I said, the case was first filed in 2014, um, and we represent several school districts, low wealth school districts in the Commonwealth, as well as individual petitioners who are parents of students who were educated in districts in the Commonwealth, and two um, organizations that represent both individuals and different school districts in the Commonwealth. And so we filed the suit alleging that um, the state is not meeting its constitutional requirement to educate all students within the Commonwealth and provide them with the education that they are guaranteed by the constitution, which is a thorough and efficient education. And that is clear across however you cut, however you cut the pie across all sorts of different measures that low wealth school districts are not getting the same education as high wealth school districts, and they are not able to meet the needs of their students. Um, and I mean, the Commonwealth is just failing hundreds of thousands of students across the board who are not able to succeed academically because they weren't getting the resources and the things that they needed to be able to access their education. Um, so we filed the suit. We alleged, again, that the Constitution was being violated, both in terms of the standard, that the standard of education that the Constitution guarantees, but also that low wealth school districts were specifically being discriminated against as compared to high wealth school districts. And then that violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Pennsylvania Constitution. And so the case actually was originally dismissed and we appealed. It went up to the Supreme Court. And in 2017, we argued in front of the Supreme Court that this case needed to be heard. So in the past, uh, school funding cases in Pennsylvania had been dismissed as non-justiciable, which means that they are not within the purview of the judicial branch. They are alleg legislative um, policy decisions that are being made and that the judicial branch couldn't rule and couldn't step in. And in a landmark case in 2017, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said, no, this is so important, this can be heard. And they remanded the case back to the Commonwealth Court, which is where we had our trial, um, for the Commonwealth Court to develop a record and to give meaning to the language of the Constitution. What does it mean to have a thorough and efficient education? 
um, and to develop the record about whether that standard was being met, whether the funding in the Commonwealth was ad was adequately was whether the Commonwealth was adequately funding school districts so that they could meet that standard. And so after the case was remanded, um, we worked on it for several years. We spent a lot, a lot of time in our petitioner school districts getting to know all of the educators there, hearing their stories, getting to know what they face on a day-to-day -day basis and just the heartbreaking, heartbreaking, devastating circumstances that they have to deal with because of the lack of funding um, from the state. And we um, also worked with our experts to develop the data. Um, Pennsylvania publishes a lot of data about the schools and how schools are funded and how students are doing. And so we harnessed all of that data and analyzed it to show that it is so clear based on the numbers that low wealth school districts and under historically underperforming children economically disadvantaged children, African-American, Latino, all of them are not getting the education that they need um, because they are not getting the funding in their districts to provide the resources that they need to, to learn. Um, and so it culminated in a about four month trial. We started in November of 2021 and trial ended in March of 2022. Um, and we presented all of this to the court we we pr we proved our case um and you know we waited and here we are today um about a year later with an 800 page opinion affirming everything that we um put forward in in the suit so, so what could this mean for the future of philadelphia schools yeah i mean this is it changes everything. Um, in my view, there is a before and there is an after, and we are now in the after. Um, everyone knows that schools in the Commonwealth and that the School District of Philadelphia is underfunded. It's logical. You can look, you can see it. You talk to anyone, you talk to students, everybody knows it. But now the court has recognized that. And the court has said every student in the Commonwealth now has a constitutional right to an education. They have a constitutional right to an education that provides them with a meaningful opportunity to succeed socially, academically, and civically. And that, that means that every student in the Commonwealth needs to have access to a comprehensive, contemporary, and effective system of public education. And not only that, but education is a fundamental right. So these students now have this right that they didn't have before. And it is a right that means that the state and that the legislature has to fund their schools to give them that constitutionally guaranteed education. Um, so it is, it is just a life-changing victory. It will change the lives of the 1.7 million students who are educated in the Commonwealth today and all future students to come. Um, and we're, we're just so thrilled and so excited to see what happens next. All right, I'd like to meet Denise Clay Murray here on Fair Luck at Home Monitor. Hi, and thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I, I guess my I, I covered schools, particularly as Philadelphia School District and some school districts in um, Western Pennsylvania um, throughout the time that we've been talking about schools being underfunded. I, I think what I like for you to do first is to de, um, define what a low wealth school district is, because a lot of people, when they hear about school funding and school funding issues, they think that this is just Philadelphia, and it's actually not. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It is not. Um, we represented six school districts from across the Commonwealth, um, all different sizes, from one of the smallest school districts to Lancaster, which is one of the largest. Um, and they are exemplars of what the issues are in Lowell school districts. So that is school districts that they do not have enough wealth based on certain metrics to raise enough money based on local taxes 
to provide adequate funding to their students. So there is certain there are certain cutoffs that are used um, to look at the amount of, of funding per pupil and per student weighted need. So students who need more, how much money they are getting per student for their education. Um, and then we contrast that with school districts that are, are adequately funded um, that you know are able to raise enough money through their local property taxes to provide a higher number of dollars per student. Was part of the lawsuit, um, a dem, uh, I guess, an ask on the part of the Commonwealth to look for a different way to fund education? Because obviously, if you do it by property taxes, um, Lower Marion is going to, their property taxes are higher than Philadelphia. So was that addressed at all in the suit? It was. So one of the only justifications that the respondents in the case who were the legislature and the executive branch put forward was local control um, and that, you know, local school district districts should be able to decide how they want to raise their money and how much they want to tax. And our biggest point was that local control is illusory in that way because certain districts just don't have the money, no matter what they tax their constituents, to raise enough to provide an adequate education for their students. And so we showed through our experts that even if some of the poorest districts in the Commonwealth taxed at the highest level, they still wouldn't generate even close to the same amount of money as higher wealth students, the, the, the money just isn't there and you can't, you can't pull it out of thin air. Um, and the court agreed in the court's opinion, the court said that local control is not a meaningful justification, even at the lowest level of, of a state justification um, for these inadequacies, because it's illusory. It's not a, it is not a real um, defense or explanation for why these school districts are funded so differently. And the court said it is up to the Commonwealth to figure out how to fix that. She established what the constitutional standard is and said that is being violated. She recognized that the Commonwealth is not adequately funded, that students are not getting the resources that they need. They are not getting the education that they need to succeed. And it is up to the legislature to figure out how to fix that. So is this an enforceable lawsuit? Because you, depending on who you talk to, there, there's an enforcement mechanism or there's not an enforce, enforcement mechanism. So is there an enforcement mechanism? And if so, how does it get deployed to make a legislature that said it was okay back in the Casey administration to not fund special ed on the part of the of the Commonwealth. How do you get those folks to understand that the Constitution says you've got to put more money into schools? Yeah, that's a great question, Denise. Um, it is enforceable. That is the role of the judicial branch. And we have this opinion now. We have this 800 page opinion where the court found that the Commonwealth is not adequately funding its schools. And she recognized everything that we put forth, that every child can learn, that some students need more resources than others, and that those resources are not being provided because of the lack of funding. And she recognized education has this place in the Constitution because it is so important. It is up there as one of the most important things that was recognized by the delegates in Pennsylvania, when you look back at the constitutional history. And she recognized that it's a fundamental right. And that is, I mean, that is just huge because now there is a constitutionally recognized standard and right that has to be enforced. And she said to the legislature that that is their role. It is not, you know, it is not our role um, in the judicial branch or as litigators to say what the solution is or how much funding is needed, but it is the system is broken and it needs to be fixed. And there is a court order that says it needs to be fixed. And so we will, you know, we will hold them accountable and we will come back as often and as, as many times um, as we have to, to make sure that that constitutional standard and constitutional promise is met. Okay. Well, 
Thank you so much for um, giving us some of your time today. I, I really appreciate it, and, and and Larry does too. And it's it's a it's an issue that's been going on for a very very long time. As I said, I used to cover schools, and since the 1980s. Pennsylvania went from funding like 60% of its mandates to funding only at the, the last statistics I saw somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 or 14%. And when special ed is such a huge part of the budget, that takes school districts that don't have a lot of money and puts them behind a fairly major eight ball. So Absolutely. thank you so much for um you know, talking to us about this, and we'll be keeping an eye on it as well. So we'd love to have you back as the as it progresses, and and people find out, you know, what the leg what if anything the legislature is going to do this term. Absolutely, and and Denise, if I may, I would just like to share a few stories that the educators who came in and testified so bravely told. Because I feel like, you know, you can hear about the lawsuit, you can hear about, you know, what the Constitution guarantees, but the reason we won this suit is because of the brave, dedicated, hardworking, self-sacrificing educators from superintendents to teachers to other administrators who came in and testified about what underfunding means in their school district and the impact that it has. And from the very first witness, who was a superintendent of Panther Valley School District, to the very last, the court believed them um, and heard their stories. And so I just, I, it really impacted me. And I just wanted to share one or two of them with you and with your listeners, just to paint a picture of, of what underfunding really means. So um, the, the superintendent of Panther Valley School District testified on the very first day um, that his school district lacks the number of teachers that are needed. So class sizes have risen dramatically and they see students raising their hand, kindergartners, first graders, raising their hand, trying to get the teacher's attention. But because there are 30 plus students in the classroom with no teacher's aides, the teacher can't get to them. And he described them as children who are begging for their education, begging to be heard, but they're not able to be reached. And stories like that, just, I mean, almost every educator who testified cried on the stand. Um, man, there was not a dry eye and many times in the suit. And it just really painted a picture of what, what the reality is on the ground in so many of these school districts, as you know, um, in, in Philadelphia and just what it really means. And so we are just so hopeful that those students will now be able to be reached and that they will be able to be heard and that no child should be left with their hand up waiting, waiting for an education. Because because to be honest, I actually taught in the school district of Philadelphia for a couple of years yeah. and I, I taught an art class and I had to provide a lot of my own materials, which when you're trying to teach students photography, that gets a little pricey. Absolutely. And, and I really wasn't making a whole lot. So I, I was fortunate in that my husband was willing to help me out with that. But we're at a time where teachers have to go to Amazon to get their basic classics classroom supplies together. Absolutely. So, so you know, that that's a that's a problem. And I'm glad that it was finally addressed in Pennsylvania because it needed to be for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And that is a that is a story that unfortunately is very common. We had many, many teachers come in and say the same thing. One teacher taught from a history book that was published before 1992. The last president in that history book was Bill Clinton, and the school district could not afford to get new books. So she had to go online and use her own money to find supplemental programming, supplemental um, re, uh, materials, and she would print them out and, and she would teach from those because the school district just didn't have enough money. They had to triage, you know, can we buy this new set of history books or do we fix the leak in the roof or do we, you know, get a new kindergarten teacher so that the class sizes aren't, you know, 30 plus five-year-olds or do we get a reading specialist? I mean, over and over, we heard about educators having to triage kids' needs, having to spend their own money, as you said, because they just didn't have the resources within their school district to provide what was needed. Um, 
Yeah. And, I, mean, and I, I have one more question regarding this because this is something that's kind of been, you know, that, that we don't talk about enough when it comes to this, the, the place of testing in all of this, because you have to pay for the testing, correct? And because you have to pay for the testing, you know, it, it kind of makes sense that, you know, that's money that's being taken away from actual studying or from actual stuff that the kids need. Was that, was that addressed at all in the lawsuit? So we did use the state standards and the state PSSAs and keystones, the testing of those standards as one of the metrics to show just how many students were not getting the education that they needed um, across these school districts, across Lowell school districts. So along with graduation rates, number of students in AP classes, number of students going to college, graduating college, that was another metric that we used. Um, and many, many of the school districts testified that, you know, their curriculum wasn't up to state standards because they couldn't afford curriculum writers. Um, they couldn't afford to update their curriculum to get it in line with state standards, which, which say what a student needs to know today in the 21st century to succeed. Um, and because of the lack of of that curriculum and the lack of the ability to really teach those students and give them what they need, they were failing and failing at drastic rates. So yes, that was one of the one of the metrics that we used to show just how dire and terrible of a situation this is. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. And um, I think this is going to run tomorrow um, on our show. And hopefully, you know, you'll be able to come back and, and tell us what the progress of the suit has been and, and what's been done on the legislative level, because that's kind of where this has to go next. Absolutely. And, and you know, it, it would kind of be nice for, I mean, cause I figure if, if, the, if the Commonwealth picked up just the mandates, if they just picked up special ed, a lot of school districts would be able to climb out from under. Yeah, you are absolutely right. And I would be happy to come back. Um, thank you so much for having me. And you know, hopefully next time we speak, there will be some real change in progress that we can celebrate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Larry, I can't stop this. <laughs>